Okay, good. This lesson is being recorded. If you wish to opt out of the recording portion of today's lesson, please turn the video microphone features off during the portion of the class being recorded. I will indicate when the recording is turned off. You may turn the camera and microphone back on. All right, so let's turn that off. And this is going to be painful. I apologize in advance. Why is this not? Come on, there you go. All right, there are only a few letters that I want to go over. And I say that because for the most part, you guys are doing well. We've got some letters though that you're not doing very well with because you're not um you're not following the directions you're not doing what i have shown you to do and that kind of bothers me so let's start with the letter f this one isn't one that you're doing differently on purpose this one's a tough one kitty you need to shush jake come bring kitty into the basement with you all right starting at the floor the underline we're making an f Straight, 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 and then forward. Close at the pink, under curve F. That's actually a lot better than this morning. You go forward for the F. Some of you are doing some weird, weird, weird stuff that I can't even figure out. So, yeah, we're not doing that. Yeah, please take her. She wants you. Even if she sits there and stares at you, I don't care. Can't wait till he goes back to college on Friday. No, she doesn't squawk unless you're home. For some reason, she likes you. All right, practice some Fs, please, my friends. Practice some Fs. Page. Okay, the next letter, Mackenzie, hand down. Wait, do you need me to write the F again, Mackenzie? No. Okay, then let's hold off on that. All right, um, the next, we're going to look at a G and a Q next to each other. Both are down curve letters. Let's look at this. Down to the basement and go forward for the G. Let's do a Q. I have to go backwards. So I'm going to make a small printed G. That's how we make a G, right? That the, the little hook goes that way. Well, same thing with cursive. The hook goes that way. I'm making a printed Q. Ugh, that's hard. The hook goes that way. Well, the same thing with the cursive Q. It goes that way. Practice some G's. Practice some Q's. Know what you're doing. Don't just um, don't just do Q's. Know that you say G and make it. G, make it, and then so forth for the Q's. Do the same thing. All right. We want you to know the difference between the Q's and the G's. Practice it a few times, please. All right, the next one is a K. Some of you are forgetting that the K does not go into the basement. Under curve, like you're making the F, but you stop at the pink. Retrace it and make the P. Some of you are making this P too big and not having enough room to split and go. Nothing in a K goes below the pink line, nothing, okay? Where did the T's go? Did you get it kicked out? So practice some K's, please.
All right. The last one is an O. I am seeing a lot of you making an O that looks like this. You're looking great. And then you do this loop here. There is no loop in the O's that we do. It's just a teardrop and a doohickey. That's a really bad looking teardrop. Oh, no loneliness. Teardrop, doohickey. That's it. There's no loop at the top of an O not the version we're doing, okay? And you might say, but why does it matter, Mrs. Vossler? Mom does it this way, why can't I do it that way? Well, because when we do finally get back to school, you're gonna be graded on this. And do you really want to learn a new kind of cursive when you get back to school, or do you wanna learn it right the first time? I would think you'd wanna learn it right the first time so that it's not an issue that you know how to do this. Mackenzie, do you have a question about the letters we're doing? Yeah, that's a great looking O. Hey, leave me alone. I'm using a mouse. It's still better than some of yours. <laughs> okay, the last one is for Eli. I love you, Eli, but you're not following me. How do I know? Because look what you're doing with your S. You're going up, you're making a loop and making an S. That is not how you make an S. That is not a lowercase S. There is no loop up there, no. And some of you are having trouble with this also because of where you are in it. Um, you're probably saying, what does that mean? Well, I'll show you. You under curve to the middle, you stop, and then go straight down to make that hook, to make that J. Don't go past that line and then under curve out. Some of you are doing this. You're doing the under curve and then you're going this way first and out. Don't do that. Come straight down. Some of you are also doing this. You make the hook, but you take it past there. Please don't do that. What, what, what is this? No, don't do that. Practice some O's, practice some S's. Oh, Mackenzie, what could you possibly need? Yes, Mackenzie. Can I show you my cursive? Not right now. But yeah, I do expect you to email it to me because I always expect you guys to email them to me. All right, so Eli, turn on your microphone. All right, so you paid attention to how to do this, right? Yes. All right, and if ever we have a graded assignment like we had this week and you would like to retry it, do it, I'm okay with that. I, I, I have no problem with regrading things if you are working hard at making improvements. That's the point of learning. You learn, you do better, and you show that you know more. I'm not trying, it's not like a, a gotcha type of situation where, oh, he didn't do it right. Yeah, I'm going to get him for that. No, 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 really. No, I want you to learn. So if you could show me that you are doing better at something, I certainly would love to see that. All right. So I'm going to close this out because it's scaring me. No, don't save those changes. That's scary. All right, what I am going to do though, I know you're gonna laugh, I don't care. You can laugh all you want. I'm gonna be reading to you from the mouse and the motorcycle, but that's not the part to laugh at. The part that to laugh at is I'm just going to, since all I did was read a book earlier, I'm gonna do the recording. I didn't stop to talk to anyone, I just read to you. So, let's see. Let's turn this up. I'm going to fast forward through the cursive because we just did the cursive and that part I wanted to do with you. OK, 
Amo. Amo. Okay. So let's get past. See how horrible my cursive is. Yeah, it's horrible. Oh, then I started reading. So let's find out where I am. Anxious night. I'll be reading to you from the Mass and the Motorcycle. All right, I'm going to get a couple of chapters done. Which is pretty cool because we are a little bit, I don't want to say behind because there's no schedule, but behind where I'd like for us to be. All right. Chapter 10, An Anxious Night. At first, Ralph's scheme worked. Keith delivered the promised bacon, toast, and jelly. The mice ate sparingly and laid aside the leftovers against the day Keith must leave the hotel. Ralph's mother continued to worry about tipping room service. I want to do the right thing, she insisted. There must be some way we can manage a tip. The mice dared not leave the nest to search for small coins that might have rolled under beds and dressers. It was late in the afternoon when Ralph heard Keith and his parents returning to their rooms. Very quietly, so that his toenails did not make scrabbling sounds in the woodwork, he slipped to the knot hole and peeped out in time to see Keith flop down on the bed. Do I have to go down to the dining room for dinner? Keith asked his mother and father. I'm not hungry. Uh-oh, thought Ralph. There goes dinner. I told you not to eat that whole bag of peanuts so close to dinner time, said his father. I didn't eat all of it, said Keith. That's good, thought Ralph. At least there would be peanuts for dinner. You'll feel better after you get washed up for dinner, said Mrs. Wrigley. Hurry along now. When his parents had gone into room 216, Ralph noticed that Keith seemed to drag himself off the bed. He walked to the wash basin, turned on the cold water, moistened his fingers, and wiped them over his face. Then he turned off the water and gave the middle of his face a swipe with a towel, which he returned to the towel rack in such a way that it immediately fell to the floor. Keith did not pick it up, but there was nothing unusual about this. Boys rarely picked up towels. What was unusual was that Keith returned to the bed where he sat down and stared at the wall. He did not play with his cars, nor did he eat the rest of his peanuts. He just sat there. Ralph stuck his head out of the knot hole. Anything wrong? He asked. Oh, hi, answered Keith listlessly. I feel sort of awful. Say, that's too bad. Ralph ventured a little farther out of the knot hole. I know what you mean. Thinking about the motorcycle makes me feel awful too. It's not that kind of awful, said Keith. I feel awful in a different way, sort of in my insides. Think you'll make it to dinner? Asked Ralph. Oh, I guess so. There was no enthusiasm in Keith's voice. Anything I could bring you? Whatever is handy, said Ralph who hesitated to place an order when he could see Keith did not feel like going to dinner at all. We are sort of depending on you. The housekeeper found all those sheets I had to chew through to get out of the hamper, and I understand she got pretty excited about mice. We are lying low until the whole thing blows over. A smile flickered across Keith's face. Don't worry, I won't let you down. I saved you some peanuts. I thought they might be handy for storing. Gee, thanks, said Ralph. Keith got slowly off the bed and poked the peanuts one by one through the knot hole. When he had finished, Ralph popped it out again and said, thanks a lot. Keith smiled feebly and popped down on the bed once more. Ralph went to work, moving the peanuts away from the knot hole to make room for whatever dinner Keith brought. He felt it would be fun to be surprised by the menu this time. It was something of a shock to find that dinner, which was stuffed through the knot hole much earlier than Ralph expected, consisted of a couple of broken soda crackers. Ralph poked his head out to see if more was coming, but Keith was getting into his pajamas. Aren't you going to bed pretty early? asked Ralph, 
realizing he had not heard Keith's parents come in. I felt so awful I couldn't eat, so they told me I had better come up and go to bed. Keith tossed his shirt on the foot of the bed and pulled on his pajamas. When his head emerged, he said, I'm sorry about your dinner. It was the best I could do. All I had was a little soup. That's all right. Ralph was beginning to be concerned. If the boy could not eat, neither could the mice. Keith fell into bed and Ralph ran off to report the news to his relatives. What a shame, said Ralph's mother. The poor boy. Oh dear, whatever shall we do? cried Aunt Dorothy. Our very lives depend upon him. The little cousins huddled together, big eyed and frightened. Yes, what about us? asked Uncle Lester. How are we going to manage if he doesn't bring us our meals? It isn't safe for us to go out pilfering when the housekeeper has declared war on mice. I knew it was a mistake to, to depend upon people, said Aunt Sissy. We'll manage somehow. We always have. Ralph's mother was trying to be brave, but Ralph could see how worried she was. After all, he did bring us a supply of peanuts. We should be grateful for that. He didn't bring many peanuts, said Uncle Lester. Uncle Lester did not sound the least bit grateful. The greedy fellow's probably ill from stuffing himself with nuts. He should have saved for us. Serves him right. Now Lester, fussed Ralph's mother, the boy had a right to eat his own peanuts, but I do wish he hadn't been quite so hungry. Ralph returned to the nut hole. Keith was lying in bed with his sports car in one hand. How do you feel now? asked Ralph. Awful, answered Keith. Before Ralph could reply, footsteps in the hall warned him that Keith's parents were coming. He drew back inside the knot hole where he could observe without being seen. Mrs. Gridley paused by her son's bed and laid her hand on his forehead. He does feel a little warm, she remarked. He'll probably be all right in the morning, said Mr. Gridley. He just hiked too far in the sun this afternoon. I hope so. The boy's mother sounded less certain. Mr. Gridley filled a glass at the wash basin and brought it to Keith. Dear son, drink this. When Keith had drunk the water, he fell back on the pillow and closed his eyes. His parents went quietly into room 216. When it was good and dark, Ralph ventured through the knot hole. He could hear Keith breathing deeply and he knew that he was asleep. Since he had no one to talk to, he found his little crash helmet where he had hidden it behind the curtain. And after he had adjusted the rubber band under his chin, he climbed up to the windowsill to look out into the world beyond the hotel and to dream about the lost motorcycle. From his perch on the windowsill, Ralph saw the parking lot held more cars than usual. This meant that the motels back on the highway were full and travelers had followed the sign pointing to the Mountain View Inn. Okay. He could hear the holiday weekend activity in the halls too. People walking up and down, luggage being set with a thump on the floor, keys rattling in the locks. Gradually, as the night wore on, the hotel grew silent, more silent than usual, for now even the second floor mice were quiet. There was no scurrying, scrabbling, or squeaking inside the walls. In the silence, Keith tossed in his sleep and mumbled something that sounded like motorcycle. In a movement, his mother slipped through the doorway pulling her robe on over her nightgown. Ralph hid behind the curtain, peeping out just enough to see what was going to happen. She laid her hand on her son's forehead and murmured, oh dear. Almost at once, she was joined by Keith's father, who was tying the belt to his bathroom. What's the trouble, he asked. Keith has a fever, answered the mother. He's burning up. Ralph was shocked. The boy really was sick. It was not too many peanuts or too much hiking. The boy was really and truly sick. The father turned on the lamp on the bedside table and he too laid his hand on the boy's forehead. Keith opened his eyes. I'm so hot, he mumbled. I want a drink. His mother pulled back a blanket while the father brought 
brought a glass of water and held up his son's head so he could drink part of it. Ralph watched anxiously, but this time he was not selfishly concerned about room service. He was concerned about Keith, the boy who had saved him from a terrible fate in the wastebasket and who had trusted him with his motorcycle. The boy who had forgiven him when he had lost the motorcycle and who had brought food, not only for Ralph, but for his old, old family. We had better give him an aspirin to bring down his temperature, said Mrs. Gridley. Mr. Gridley started toward room 216, stopped and snapped his fingers as if he had just remembered something. I took the last one back in Rock Springs, Wyoming, he said. I had a headache from driving toward the sun all afternoon. I meant to buy some more when we stopped, but I didn't think of it again until now. I should have thought of it myself, said Mrs. Gridley. I knew we were almost out. Never mind, I'll get some. Mr. Gridley picked up the telephone, listened, shook it, listened again, and said, that's peculiar. The line seems to be dead. They must disconnect the switchboard at night, said the mother, but surely there is someone on duty at the desk downstairs. Every hotel has a night clerk. I'll go find out, said the father, and slipped out the door into the hall. I'm so hot, mumbled Keith. I'm so hot. His mother wrung out a washcloth in the wa cold water and laid it on her son's forehead. You'll feel better as soon as we get you an aspirin, she whispered. The minutes dragged by. What's keeping him, thought Ralph. Why doesn't he hurry? The old hotel snapped and creaked. Keith rolled and tossed, trying to find a cool spot on the pillow, and his mother wrung out the washcloth in more cold water. Is dad coming, asked Keith his eyes bright and his cheeks flushed. In a minute, soothed his mother. He'll be here in a minute. He wish she would hurry, thought Ralph. Still, the minutes dragged. Finally, footsteps were heard in the hall and Mr. Gridley returned to room 215. He's here, he's here with the aspirin, whispered Mr. Gr Mrs. Gridley to Keith. At last, thought Ralph. I thought he would never come. Mr. Gridley shook his head. There isn't an aspirin to be found any place. He sounded thoroughly exasperated. First of all, the night clerk was sound asleep on the couch in the lobby. I had a dickens of a time waking him up, and when I finally ma did manage to, he couldn't find any aspirin anywhere. Oh no, exclaimed his mother. Oh no, echoed Ralph's thoughts. What about that little gift shop off the lobby? Asked Mrs. Ridley. It must sell aspirin. Locked up tight and the clerk went home with the key, answered Mr. Gridley. Oh dear. The night clerk was really very nice about it, said the father. He even came up and looked in the housekeeper's office. How far is the nearest drugstore? 25 miles back on the main highway, answered the father. And it closed at 10 o'clock and doesn't open until nine in the morning. The mother held her watch under the lamp. And it's almost one o'clock. It is hours until morning. She crossed the room to wring out the washcloth again. What will we do? What can we do? Asked the father helplessly. I even telephoned the doctor, but there has been a bad accident back on the highway and he can't come. The night clerk said he would telephone the milkman before he starts his route at six and ask him if he can bring some aspirin, but he won't get here until seven or later. All we can do is wait. Keith tossed, Keith tossed under the cold washcloth. Um, I think I'd like to go to sleep now, he muttered thickly. I guess that is all you can do, said his mother, and bent over to kiss his hot forehead before she turned up the light. Ralph did not even wait for the boy's parents to leave the room. As soon as the light was out, he leapt silently to the carpet, and by the time they had gone through the doorway into room 216, he had hidden his little crash helmet behind the curtain and was halfway through the knot hole. Somewhere, someplace in that hotel, there must be an aspirin tablet that Ralph was going to find, and Ralph was going to find it. He only wished he had the motorcycle so he could travel faster. Chapter 11, The Search. I have to go out into the hotel, Ralph informed his relatives. I've got to help the boy. Oh no. Not out into the hotel, cried Ralph's mother. 
not while the housekeeper is looking for mice. If you're seen, you'll be in danger. We'll all be in danger. I'll be back before dawn, said Ralph staunchly. I must go. Don't try to stop me. See here, my boy, Orange being a bit dramatic, asked Uncle Lester. Whatever do you have to go out in the hotel for? To pilfer a pill, said Ralph, an aspirin tablet. His answer was dramatic enough even for Uncle Lester. His entire family stared at him in disbelief. Not an aspirin, not after his own father had been poisoned by one of the dread tablets. An aspirin, Ralph's mother gasped. No, Ralph, not that, anything but that. It is the only way. Ralph stood tall and brave. The boy has a fever and he needs an aspirin. I'm going to find him one. Oh, Ralph, his mother hid her face in her paws. But Ralph, quavered Aunt Sissy, remember your father. You can't carry an aspirin in your cheek pouches. It would poison you. How could you get one here? I'll find a way. Ralph was, oh, was outwardly steadfast in his determination, but inside he wondered how he would manage to get an aspirin into room 215 if he didn't find one. If he did find one, roll it perhaps. Ralph, stay here, pleaded his mother. You're too young, let your uncle Lester go. Well, now let's talk this over, said Uncle Lester. Who keeps leaving? There you go. Okay, Kelly, put your hand down, please. Nolan and Vivi. I know Nolan's having internet issues. All right. I'm not too young and I haven't a moment to lose. Ralph, who was really frightened by what he was about to do, also enjoyed the drama of the moment. Goodbye, I shall return before dawn. Ralph, promise me you'll be careful, pleaded his mother. Promise me you won't climb into suitcases like your Aunt Adrian. Ralph's Aunt Adrian, who liked nice things, had climbed into a suitcase to examine a nylon stocking. Someone had closed the suitcase, and Aunt Adrian had never been seen again. It was hoped she had been carried away to the luxury. Promise me, Ralph, cried his mother, but her son was already on his way out the knot hole. Ralph scurried across the carpet of room 215, flattened himself, and squeezed under the door. Once out into the hall, his, his courage ebbed. The aspirin tablet seemed a very small thing to find in such a vast place. It would be much easier to find the motorcycle. No, thought Ralph, I must not even think about the motorcycle. Ralph began to feel pretty small himself much smaller than he had felt during his show of bravery back in the mouse nest. Down in the lobby, a clock struck one. It was not a moment to lose. He ran to the next room, squeezed under the door, and searched under the beds and the dresser while the two guests slept soundly. All he found was a bobby pin. He skipped room 211 because his enemy, the little terrier, was still there, and ran on to room 209. A hurried search, frightening because of the loud and uneven snores that came from one of the beds, revealed nothing but a few pretzel crumbs, which Ralph did not have time to eat. On and on ran Ralph, down the hall, under doors, around, under beds and dressers. There was not a single aspirin tablet to be found. In one of the rooms, he did see a penny that had rolled under the luggage rack and remembered his mother's wish to leave a tip for room service. But tonight he had no time for pennies. He must press on and find an aspirin. A small doubt began to creep into Ralph's thoughts as he ran down the hall to the last room on the second floor. Maybe there was no aspirin. Maybe he was risking his life and the lives of his family for nothing. But Ralph pushed, through aside, pushed the thought aside. He would not let himself become discouraged. If there was no aspirin on the second floor, there had to be one someplace on the ground floor. Tonight, he was willing to be brave, willing to brave the stairs to find it. He flattened himself and squeezed under the last door on the second floor. There was nothing under each of the beds, but the things Keith called dust mice. There was no sound but the rattle of the windows in the wind. 
Ralph started across the carpet towards the dresser when suddenly a light from the bedside table blinded him. He stopped, rooted to the carpet by fear, even though it was not likely that anyone was going to cut off his tail with a carving knife. Think about three blind mice. See how they run. They all ran after the farmer's wife who cut off his tail with a with the butcher knife. Yeah, that's what he's talking about. He heard someone slip out of bed and utter a sound halfway between a squeal and a scream. Before Ralph knew what was happening, an ordinary drinking glass had been clapped down over him, and there he stood in a glass trap. By then, his eyes were adjusted to the light, and he found himself facing a pair of bare feet. Looking up, he saw that the feet belonged to a young woman in a pink nightgown. Mary Lou, wake up, she whispered to the young woman in the other bed. Look what I've caught. Huh? said Mary Lou, blinking and raising up on one elbow. Her hair was done up on pink rollers. Betty, are you out of your mind? It must be past one in the morning. The night was slipping by much too quickly for the trapped mouse. He was terrified and he was desperate. No one in his family had ever been trapped under a drinking glass before. Worst of all, he was failing keep and endangering his family. Wake up, Mary Lou, and look insisted Betty. I was getting up to stop the rattle in the window and caught a mouse. This news roused Mary Lou from bed, and the two young women knelt on the carpet to look at Ralph, who promptly turned his back. He did not care to be stared at in his misery, but it was no use. The women moved around to the other side of the glass. Isn't he darling, said Betty. Just look at his cunning little paws. Mary Lou leaned closer for a better look. And his little ears, aren't they sweet? Betty was delighted. It was disgusting. It was bad enough to be trapped and stared at, but to have this pair carrying on in such a gushy fashion was almost more than Ralph could stomach. Cunning little paws indeed. They were strong paws, paws for grasping the handle grips on a, of a motorcycle. Oh, Betty, do you suppose we could take him back to Wichita with us? Asked Mary Lou. My third grade would love him. So would my kindergarten, agreed Betty. We could keep him in a cage on the ledge and all the children could bring him food from home. It would be such a good experience for them to have a pet in the classroom. Well, thought Ralph grimly, I always wanted to travel. A cage in a kindergarten in Wichita, however, was not exactly the destination he had in mind. The minutes were slipping by dangerously fast. He had to do something. Look, he shouted through the glass in desperation. Let me go. Please let me go. There's something terribly important I've got to do. He squeaked, marveled Betty. He's adorable, squealed Mary Lou. It was no use. Young women could not speak his language. Ralph was in despair. He thought of Keith tossing feverishly in his bed and of his family huddled in the mouse nest waiting for his safe return. But I don't see how we could take him back to Wichita, said Betty sensibly. We're driving to San Francisco and then to Disneyland before we head, start back. How could we carry him thousands of miles? The two teachers looked thoughtfully at Rat, who knew his fate depended upon their decision. Was he to be carried to Disneyland and eventually to a ledge in a kindergarten room in Wichita? Or would they let him go? A third possibility crossed Ralph's mind. Perhaps they would leave him under the glass for the housekeeper to see. He hoped not. He did not think he could last that long. Already the inside of the glass was beginning to feel warm and airless. I suppose we really shouldn't turn him loose in the hotel, said Mary Lou. Mice are pests, even if they are cute. The teacher not only destroyed Ralph's hopes, hurt his feelings as well, calling him a pest when he was on an errand of mercy. From the mouse's point of view, the teachers were the pests. I know, exclaimed Betty suddenly, causing Ralph to look over his shoulder for a clue to what, to what it was she knew. I know how we can get rid of him without hurting him. The young teacher reached over to the bedside table where she picked up a picture postcard. She slid it carefully under the glass and under Ralph's feet so that he was now standing on a postcard. He noticed the picture was of a giant redwood tree 
the same postcard all travelers bought when they came to California. Now, what are you going to do? Asked Mary Lou. Watch. Betty carefully lifted the postcard, Ralph, and the glass and walked across the room. Even though he knew it was useless, Ralph scrabbled around in his tiny prison. He was afraid she was taking him toward the wash basin. He had heard of mice being drowned by people who did not like traps. The teacher walked not to the wash basin, but to the open window. She held Ralph across the sill, removed the postcard from the glass, and gave it a little jerk that shook Ralph off into the vines that grew up the side of the building. There, she said. And that is where we're going to stop, I think. All right, my friends. So thank you for sitting through that. I'm not sure where my friend. Oh, there's Dwayne. Dwayne's coming back. Glad you came back, Dwayne. Thought you would have left me. All right. So um, let me stop the recording.